Welcome to this month's market update. I'm joined today by Dr. Shahana Mukuji from our capital markets and asset allocation team. Hi there, Shahana. Hi, Wayne. Now, um, quite a lot of activity around central banks across the globe. Could you let's start today? Maybe if you could take us through some of that. Sure, Wayne. So quite a number of central banks have continued to increase their interest rates or at least maintained a tightening monetary policy stance. But there's also a difference emerging between some of the leading central banks, particularly among or in advanced economies. For instance, the European Central Bank raised their key policy rates by 25 basis points at its September meeting, and this has effectively taken the deposit facility rate to a record high of 4%. But taking a somewhat different approach is the Reserve Bank of Australia, which left its cash rate unchanged at 4.1% at its September meeting. This was the third straight month where the policy rate was left unchanged. Similarly, the Bank of Canada hit the pause button in September, leaving their policy rate at 5% after significant tightening since March last year. Uh, so you've highlighted some of those differences uh, in approaches. Maybe if you could just unpack that a little bit for us and give us a bit more of your, your assessment of the detail behind those differences. Sure, Wayne. So central banks are keeping their monetary settings restricted, but some are increasingly conscious of the extent of tightening that has been delivered since last year. While inflation is moderating, the headline rate is still high and above central bank targets in a number of economies, such as Australia, the United Kingdom, parts of the European Union, all of which suggests that some further tightening may be required to bring down inflation to more manageable levels. But the observed impact on economic growth till date has varied across some of these economies. In Australia, for example, the Reserve Bank of Australia has emphasized that the rate pause will provide more time to assess the impact of delivered rate increases on the economy. And while inflation is moderating here in Australia and expected to continue on that path over the next few months, higher utility costs, services prices, as well as ongoing rental pressures, which are fairly strong from housing market imbalances, could still keep inflation sticky in the short term. Now, some measures do indicate further moderation in economic activity. The Australian economy expanded by a moderate 0.4% over the June quarter, driven primarily by exports and new investments. However, household consumption slowed and discretionary spending fell for the third consecutive quarter reflecting some of that ongoing pressure from higher costs of living, as well as higher interest payments. And while the change or the adjustment in consumption does suggest that interest rates are working or flowing through the economy, employment conditions have remained strong. They point to a tight labor market. Household house prices have continued to increase across major capital cities, and producers and consumers are also facing higher energy prices all of which could add to inflationary pressures in the short term. For, from a policy perspective, an important consideration will also be how households with existing mortgages respond as the bulk of fixed rate loans expire or roll over to variable rate loans over the next several months. And so given the uncertainty associated with a number of these factors, the RBA has maintained the rate pause. However, it has also maintained or emphasized on their tightening bias suggesting in a number of recent statements that some further tightening may be required contingent on how economic conditions evolve. So lots of focus uh, on interest rates and then inflation. And of course, uh, for us here in Australia, we've seen uh, some devaluation in the Australian dollar. Um, what are some of the risks that come with that? Yes, so we have seen the Australian dollar depreciate quite a fair bit since July and it came down from just over 0 0.67 cents to the US dollar back in mid to late July to just over 0 0.64 cents to the US dollar as of this week. Now, there are two main factors which have contributed to a weaker Australian dollar. The first, of course, being the strong economic data coming up, the US, which demonstrates the resilience of the economy, the US economy. Now, this has partly contributed to the US Federal Reserve's decision to raise their policy rate to the range of 5.25% to 5.5% back in July. But this also contrasts with the Reserve Bank of Australia's policy move, which has effectively left the cash rate unchanged since June. 
So there is the issue of a wider interest rate differential, and this is one of the factors which has partly contributed towards a weaker Australian dollar in, in, in more recent weeks. Another factor, of course, is the weakness in China's economic recovery, and in particular in China's domestic demand and the ongoing problems or the weakness associated with an ailing property sector. With China being Australia's largest export market, how quickly and swiftly economic recovery rebounds will be very important in determining or assessing Australia's trade outlook. And so in terms of the short term risks for the Australian dollar, I would say that it will be important to look at how the interest rate differentials evolve primarily between Australian and global interest rates, how that evolves over the next few months, but also the timing as well as the effectiveness of policy stimulus in reviving China's economic growth. I think these two factors will be quite important in seeing how um, the Aussie dollar tracks over the next few months. Well, some very big themes we've discussed today, uh, not just for institutional investors, but for households as well, indeed. Thank you for your analysis, Shahana, and thank you for watching this month's Market Update. Mm -hmm.